let's get deeper into the Kalash files. We're going to be talking about a new rifle that will probably be the baseline that we compare all other rifles to. And I'm really excited because it's going to be my first Comblock AK-47. But before we get into that, I want to hear from you guys. Sound off in the comment section down below. What is your favorite AK-47? AKM pattern rifle? Is it one that you already own, one that you're saving up for, or one that's just on your wish list and you'll probably never get it <laughs> unless you win the lottery or something like that? Let me know. I want to hear what you guys are looking at down in the comments. We'll catch you there. With that being said, let's just dive right in into this. The RH-10 from Century Arms. This is my very first Comblock rifle, and I'm extremely excited to have this into my collection because um, it's been kind of kind of my favorite, uh, especially when it comes to a budget-minded rifle, especially for an AK-47. This is probably going to be one of the cheaper imports that you can buy. In order for us to talk about this rifle, we're going to need to talk about a, another rifle, and that's going to be the Wasser 10. This rifle and the Wasser 10 are basically the same rifle. They are both patterned off of the Romanian Model 63, and they are built in the Kruger Arms factory, obviously in Romania, and then imported into the United States under R22 compliance by Century Arms. Now, the Wasser is uh, kind of an interesting little tale to talk to you guys about. Wasser is an acronym. It actually stands for the Wassenaar Arrangement Semi-Automatic Rifle. And it, uh, as I mentioned, is patterned off of the Romanian Model 63. Now, it does have a bit of a love-hate relationship in the AK community because a lot of the first Wassers that were imported were not very good quality. They had a lot of QA, QC issues. Um, from what I understand, and I could be mistaken on this, but way I understand it is the first ones that came into the United States were built from surplus demilled uh, AKs from Romania. So some of the barrels had been shot out. There was a lot of inconsistency because a lot of the parts had been worn. Uh, so not the best uh, to build a new rifle from. So when it got into a lot of the civilians' hands, there were reliability issues, there were accuracy issues, and uh, a lot of people weren't a fan of it. But with that being said, uh, as of now and here in the recent past, all of the RH-10s and the Wassers are built from brand new parts. Uh, so you should not have any issues whatsoever when it comes to that. So let's dive into the RH-10. Like I said, it's basically a Wasser with a few differences, some quote unquote upgrades, but uh, let's talk about those. The first thing you're going to notice is the combo block. This is known as a combination block uh, or combo block because it is a combination gas block front sight post. For some people, they don't like that look. I particularly do. I like this arrangement because it kind of reminds me of like a Arsenal 107 or a, an AK-74, something like that. I like the 90 degree uh, gas block. That's just a personal preference, not that big of a deal. It doesn't change anything functionally with the rifle, but it does offer some advantages and disadvantages. The advantages to it is obviously the front sight post is further away from the muzzle. So if you're interested in doing something with the barrel, like maybe turning this into an SBR, you can chop down the barrel and then set it up with the type of muzzle device that you would prefer. Fill out your forms, pay your tax stamp, and you'll have an SBR. If you're not interested in doing all of the paperwork and spending extra money to do that, you could chop down the barrel and to like 14.5, 14.7, put the muzzle device of your choice on there, pin and weld it, and then you would have a 16-inch uh, barrel in that configuration. As it stands right now, this is a 16.5-inch cold hammer forged barrel, and then it has a 
A2 style flash hider that is just torqued on with the 14-1 left-handed thread pitch uh, at the end here. So that basically covers uh, the major differences here with the com block. Let's talk about some of the other upgraded features. And the next thing we're gonna talk about is going to be the rear sight. The rear sight has an integrated windage adjustment, uh, which is kind of a nice little feature, especially if you're new to the AK world and you may not have a front sight adjustment tool. Um, having windage adjustment back here would make your life a lot easier because all you'll need to do is have some uh, needle nose pliers with the front sight to adjust the elevation, windage back here, and you're good to go. You don't have to spend any extra money trying to find a front sight adjustment tool. Sometimes those can be hard to find, but uh, that's kind of one of the major advantages. Personally, I'm not a big fan of this. The disadvantage to this is the fact that it's pretty clunky. Uh, the adjustments on here for the different uh, known range adjustments on, it, it's just, it, it, it's like I said, it's clunky. It doesn't line up with the <laughs> meter marks on here. And then if you're the type of person that wants to set this to battle zero to zero your rifle, uh, you can't do it because of all of this junk going on back here with the windage adjustment. So I will probably change this out to a standard AKM rear sight, uh, but that'll be down in the future. I don't know when that's going to happen. So, all right, so the next piece that is kind of an upgraded feature is going to be the trigger. Uh, typically on like the Wassers, you're going to have a Tapco G2 trigger, but this has the Century Arms RAK trigger, and uh, <laughs> let me tell you, it's pretty nice. The pull weight on it is about three and a half pounds. I, I can get three and a half pounds consistently with my Wheeler gauge, and uh, I'm a big fan. I'm just a really big fan. The Tapco G2 triggers, from what I've seen from Robski at AK Operators Union, seems to be a little bit... Uh, Oversprung has a little bit too much tension in the spring. So as that hammer falls, it's you know coming down a little bit harder than some of the other triggers out there. And what that does is kind of deforms the tail on the carrier. Is that big of an is is that kind of a big issue? No, it's really not. But you know, for some of us, we kind of like to keep our rifles in as good a condition as possible. The more we shoot, the more deformation that happens. And from what I can see with the RAK trigger, that's not as much of a problem uh, based off of the different videos I've seen from Robski on the RHT and, and the Wasser. So those are uh, some of the great upgrades that we have with the RH-10 compared to its Wasser Brethren. With that being said, everything else is pretty standard when it comes to a Romanian rifle. It is not going to have the dimples here on the receiver, so if that's something that you're interested in, it's not going to have it. Uh, the rivets on this are pretty good. Uh, I don't have any noticeable issues so far. And then the receiver is going to have a parkerized finish, so it's matte black. Um, I kind of like parkerized finishes because the more that you work on it, uh, the more you shoot it, the more you take it in and out of gun cases, the more you love on it. Uh, uh, it's just going to start having a nice patina to it. It's going to have that battle-worn look to it. So I'm kind of interested to see what happens to the receiver as we move on down the road. So let's talk about some of the, some of the things that are not so great with it. I've already talked about uh, the pros and cons about the combo block, talked about the uh, pros and cons with the rear sight, but when it comes to this rifle, you guys may know, you may not know, I love blondes. I love the blonde furniture on this. Uh, I'm married a blonde, so <laughs> but uh, I will say that the furniture is not the highest quality. You can tell just by feeling it that it just doesn't feel right. It is um, American made, so uh, they're probably cutting corners on cost there. I don't know if you guys can see it, but right here it's already dinged up, so the wood's kind of soft. 
And then if you run a couple magazines through this pretty quickly, the hand guards, they're going to transmit heat pretty quickly as well. Uh, if you're not wearing a glove, if you're not doing the Michael Jackson thing with this, uh, it's going to be uncomfortable to shoot after a couple of <laughs> magazines. So I do have some uh, surplus furniture on its way in. It is refinished. Uh, so as soon as it comes in, I'll swap everything out and I will show you guys what it looks like from there. But I'm kind of excited to see see how that uh, kind of changed this, the look on it. The next thing that I'm not necessarily a big fan of is this hooded front sight. Uh, when I draw up on a target, um, it just kind of seems a little claustrophobic, a little cluttered. Um, it obscures the target a little bit more than I would like. Something I'm just gonna have to get used to. It's not that big of a deal, but it, I'm not uh, a big fan as of yet. That may change over time, but something I'm gonna to have to get used to. The last thing I will say about this is talking with Mike from Semi-Armed Life Podcast, talking with Brandon Herrera, uh, this rifle seems to be a little overgassed. And the reason why I say that is I run a drill called the one through five drill. If you're not familiar with that, basically the short of it is you have three targets in front of you, about five to seven yards, and you're going to progressively increase the number of rounds that you shoot into those targets, moving from left to right and then back to left. So your first target on the left is going to get one, then it's, the middle is going to get two, the right's going to get three, move back to the middle for four, back to the left for five. And I really like that drill because it's going to work on a number of different fundamentals. First, it's going to work on target transition. It's going to also work on shot placement under stress, trying to go as fast as you possibly can. And then it's going to work on your trigger control and throttling. So as you start, it's one, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. And obviously you're trying to go as quickly and as accurately as possible. So working a couple different things all at once, really do like that. And what I've noticed with this rifle is as I'm moving to three, four, and five, uh, I'm starting to notice that that muzzle start to lift. That is more than likely caused from it being overgassed. So it's pushing that carrier back a little bit harder than it should. And it's causing that rifle to rise as the carrier hits the rear trunnion. I don't know if that's exactly what's happening with this, but that could be a case because uh, the Wassers and the RH-10 are kind of known for having uh, gas issues. You know, they're, they're a little overgassed. So with that being said, how do you correct it? Uh, you can swap out the spring, uh, get an upgraded ALG, trig, uh, ALG spring rather. Uh, that could help, or like I mentioned earlier, you could chop this down to 14.5, 14.7, put a muzzle device, pin and weld it, and what that will do is reduce the dwell time of that round coming through the barrel, uh, which decreases the pressure and will reduce the recoil just a little bit. Will that change much on this? I don't know. Am I going to do it? Maybe. Uh, we'll see. Uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll go from there. At the end of the day, I've had a uh, great time shooting this rifle. No major complaints as of yet. We will use this to compare it to the GF3 coming up here pretty soon. So we're going to look at accuracy and we're going to get uh, this sighted in at 100 meters. Uh, get the iron sights you know, set up at 100 meters and um, test out what the difference is, is between the GF3 and this one as far as accuracy goes. There you have it, there is the RH10. I'm excited about this. I hope you guys are too. Again, this is going to be the baseline because I think that this is probably the best imported rifle that you can buy on a budget. Um, this is coming in from Atlantic Firearms right around that $610 mark, give or take a few dollars. Um, that's what I bought it for. And the Wasser is going to come in right around that $700 to $710 mark, depending on, you know, when you buy it. Prices may vary, obviously, but uh, um, it's interesting that this is the upgraded version. 
but it's less expensive. I don't know why that is. My hypothesis is that it has to do with the fact that this is newer than the Wasser. Market uh, has a little bit more confidence in the uh, Wasser compared to this. So that may be one of the major reasons. Maybe people aren't buying the RH10 as much as they are the Wasser because Wasser's been around for a while, they know it. So with that being said, is the RH10 a rifle that you guys would be interested in, sound off in the comment section down below. In addition to that, what are some of the things that you guys are wanting me to do as far as comparison goes? I have some uh, ideas of myself. Uh, accuracy, obviously, uh, you know, we'll start taking a look at the internal components to see what the uh, wear-in period looks like and uh, see if there's any um, major issues with uh, premature wearing or you know deformation in that carrier tail whatever the case may be but i want to hear from you guys as well what are some of the things you're expecting to see sound off in the comment section down below with that being said it's really all i got this time thanks so much for swinging by if you guys are interested in supporting the channel the best way you can do that is by subscribing and hitting the notification bell give me a thumbs up or share it with your friends if you guys are already a subscriber and you feel that I deserve that. Another great way to do that is by swinging by fitandfire.com. I will have links to this uh, rifle over there as well as the other stuff that I'm using, especially with these uh, Midwest industry rails and uh, magazines and all that jazz. I'll have all the links that you guys need over at fitandfire.com. So, Appreciate you guys swinging by. Thank you so much for spending your time with me. Uh, we will get out of here until next time. Thank you so very much. As always, freedom through strength. Here comes a high five. You guys ready? Here we go. Bye, y'all.